the director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. Welcome to tonight's forum, a conversation with Ambassador Gary Locke. The ambassador is a visiting fellow at the Institute of Politics this week, and joining the ambassador in tonight's discussion is Karen Mills. Karen Mills served as the 23rd administrator of the Small Business Administration mm -hmm. from 2009 to 2013, during which time the president elevated her to the rank of cabinet level officer. Mills has been credited with making the SBA really work for small businesses. This is major in a time when we hear constant complaints about how tough it is to make government work for those who rely on it. Karen succeeded in making the SBA customer friendly and also effective. Her business leadership positions are widely varied and too numerous to mention, but let me mention two of my favorites. One, the governor of Maine appointed her to a state council to redevelop the closed Brunswick Naval Air Station. In this position, she helped organize an alliance of local boat builders, material manufacturers, and University of Maine researchers that succeeded in making Maine's boat building globally competitive. And she was the founding partner in managing of Solero uh, Capital, a woman-owned venture capital firm that invested in many women-owned businesses. She is the leading expert on business innovation, on managing, investing in small businesses, and on America's global competitiveness. And she is a groundbreaking thinker of the highest order. She now serves as a senior fellow at both Harvard Business School and here at the Kennedy School. After she left government service, she made her transition to academia by serving as an Institute of Politics fellow. We're proud to welcome her back, Karen Gordon Mills. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be back here at, um, at the IOP, at the forum. And uh, it's also a reunion because Gary Locke and I started together in the very earliest days of the Obama administration right. in, um, in the midst of the Great Recession. Now, Gary needs no introduction except for what we should call him because he has been the governor of Washington before that, he was actually an elected official, which I cannot say about me, so you were elected many times as a state representative and as the county executive in um, the county that includes Seattle. So you've been in city, government, in state, running a state, then in the federal government as the Secretary of Commerce, and then on the world stage as the ambassador to China. So we have so many things <laughs> to discuss today. But let me start um, with the first time uh, we worked together, when you were Secretary of Commerce. And note that in today's presidential election, several candidates, I think, have decided that the Department of Commerce should be closed, should be abolished, to save money and put the money back um, but at the time that we came in the middle of the Great Recession, you did some incredible things as the head of the Department of Commerce. You um, came out with a number of programs to help entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. to drive innovation, to create jobs. What is it that you understand about the Department of Commerce that these presidential candidates just can't see? Well, when we first came in, I remember uh having a, a meeting with all the employees in a big auditorium and it was broadcast to all of our offices around the country because we have satellite offices in Colorado and, and uh, many other uh, parts of, of, of America. And I, I said to the federal employees that were gathered in the auditorium that, hey, I said, you know, as federal employees, we're not, you're not losing your health insurance benefits, you're not having your hours cut back, you're not being furloughed, and yet we know of so many relatives and friends who are having their jobs eliminated, uh, their health insurance benefits dramatically cut, or their hours cut. And I said that if this were a Hurricane Katrina, we would be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to try to restore the health and vitality of communities. And I said we are in an economic Katrina, and that everything that we do at the Department of Commerce has to be about helping people get jobs. 
and to help American companies be strong so that they can employ workers. And that means, for instance, helping American companies export. And our motto at the Department of Commerce was the more that American companies export, the more they produce. The more that they produce, the more workers they need, and that means jobs, good paying jobs for the American people. We also had a variety of programs um, at the Department of Commerce, such as Economic Development Administration grants. Let's say it's a five, $10 million grant for a small community or a large community to expand the water treatment facility that's necessary in order for this new company or existing company to come in and grow and expand and maybe hire 150 more people. But the water treatment facility for purifying water is too small or the pipes underground in the streets, uh, the sewage uh, uh, pipes are too small to handle this big new company that's coming in. And so, you know, a lot of times our bureaucracy was too slow in getting this money out. And if, and, and the, Typically on some of these grants, five, 10, 15 million dollars or to fix up the port so that more ships could come in and we could send out American-made products around the world. You know, oftentimes these grants, uh, we would make a decision after eight or nine months. Half of the time it was a no. And so these uh, uh, applicants would repackage their public-private partnership proposal. Four months later, resubmit it. Eight, nine months later, probably a yes. And I said, basically, that's almost two years. Companies and communities can't wait two years to get some of this money to help put our, our economy back on track. So we really streamlined government agencies and instead of almost 20 months, reduced it down to 18 days. Make a decision in 18 days. Get that money out. Now and I have uh, to talk to you about that because, I don't want to interrupt you, but this is a hallmark of the way you have operated from the time you were governor. You always count days. You always set a metric. In fact, I think maybe you are the government official, um, of all the government officials I've ever seen, who is most metrics driven. So now that I'm teaching at Harvard <laughs> Business School, some of my students are there, they're nodding. How, um, let me give you for instance, I read that when you were governor, you shortened the number of days it took to get a driver's license at the DMV. Then you went on and did some things that, the, that you just described, you shortened the time to get grants out at the Commerce Department. And then you went to China and you shortened the time it took to get a visa. Where did this metrics approach, where did you learn this metrics approach to government? Because I don't think um, it's really that common in our political environment. Well, um, I very much believe in government service, and I believe that government service is a noble calling, and that people who work in government, I want them to feel proud to be a government employee. I want the public to respect and value the services that government provides. We can have a debate on what is the size and the role and the functions of government, but whatever those functions are, whatever that role is, I want us to deliver those services well, efficiently, and and respond to the needs of their customers or their stakeholders, whether it's companies appealing a tax bill uh, or people trying to get a driver's license. And so when I was governor, I really wanted to raise our public perception and respect for government, and I wanted our government employees to be proud to say that they work for the state of Washington, the same way that they would be proud if they said they worked at Microsoft or Nordstrom. I wanted our administration to be known as being different. And so, uh, you know, I, I met with all the agencies and I said, you know, we've got to come up with something dramatic in each of your, your departments that shows that we're different and, and to elevate the government performance. And so, met with the Department of Licensing people. People at that time had to stand in line for an hour to renew your driver's license. And I said, that's not acceptable. That uh, epitomizes people's frustration with government. And so I said, we need dramatic improvement. And I asked them, what do you think would be dramatic? And after a few minutes, they turned around and said, 20%. I said, well, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Now, wait a second. 20% improvement off of 60 minutes is what? 12. That means I stand in line for 48 minutes. I said, I don't think the public would accept that. So I said, tell you what, our goal is 12-minute wait time. <laughs> Reaction. But I, I believe that if you set super high stretch goals, oftentimes unattainable. It forces people to completely rethink and redesign systems. And in fact, within about a year, year and a half, we got it down to 10 minutes without any new money, new employees, or new, new facilities. 
And so I really believe that we need to try to focus on those types of objectives. Well, how do you do that? Do you use technology? Do well, you I think you, you know you, you 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 have. I mean, I don't know how to pr process, uh, you know, driver's licenses. I certainly didn't know how to process visas. The Chinese people had to wait, on average, seventy to hundred days just to get a visa interview, and I said that's costing us American jobs, because I mean, if a Chinese company wants to come to America to buy some widget from a, a company in Ohio and it takes them 100 days to get a visa interview with no guarantee you get the visa, they'd say, screw it. I can go buy that widget from Canada or France and Germany. And I said, that's gonna cost us jobs. Or if you know, family wants to vacation in the United States and it takes them 100 days to get a visa interview with no guarantee that every member of the family gets the visa, they say, screw it, we'll, we'll go to Australia, we'll go to France or Germany. I said, that's costing us jobs. My people said there's nothing they could do about it unless we had more money or more staff and new interview windows. Well, there's no way we were gonna get that money from the State Department or approved by the White House and certainly not from the Congress. So I set a very ambitious goal. They didn't like it, but I said, let's try. You know, we cannot be reluctant to try things for fear that we're gonna, not gonna make it. And, and you know, I, I said, well, we settled with my managers on, f first they said 15 days, and then I said, are we talking about business days or calendar days? <laughs> and they said, of course, business days. And I said, well, that's three weeks. Now, how about calendar days? And then I finally said, uh, instead of 15 calendar days, how about 14 calendar days? So I can go around in my speeches saying our goal is two weeks. And they said, okay, to the 14 days, provided I never mention our goal in a speech. And I said, why not? They said, because our people will be so demoralized and embarrassed and shamed when we fail to meet our goal. They were already giving up. They were already saying that they couldn't reach the goal. And I think that part of the problem in government is that we're afraid to take risk, we're afraid to take, uh, have high goals for fear that we're gonna be reprimanded or you know, dismissed or terminated uh, for failing to reach that goal. And what I always wanted to do when I was in government was to set super high stretch goals knowing oftentimes for agencies they could not meet it and then actually demonstrate that we would celebrate whatever they did. To send a message that it's okay to try even if you fail. Because none of us is perfect. You know, not every baseball team can win a game. One wins, one loses. I, I'm terrible at buying stock. I buy, I, buy, I buy high and sell low, you know. Uh, we're not perfect as parents. We cannot expect perfection. And so we have to encourage people to take risks as long as they're working ethically and in good faith, that's all we can expect. And uh, we, got it down, we, got it it down. Down, we got it down within a month and a half to five days, the visas. And then over the next two years with a 70% increase in demand, it came down to three days. Three days. So without right, any new money, without any new impressive. money, without any new system, without any new people. Well, uh, I will say, uh, just last thing on this topic, that you inspired me when I came um, in small businesses weren't getting paid by government. And I was um, worried about this because the SBA is in charge of right. all the small business contracting. And I was talking to you about it and you say, well, we're paying in seven days. I said, seven? It's not even due for 30 days. And you say, well, I think the small businesses need the money. So months later, I was with the president in Iowa and a small business owner was complaining about not getting paid by the Department of Defense and a light bulb went off. I said, let's do the Gary Locke program for all the small business owners. And the president, I said the president, not being ambitious like Gary, we're gonna do 20 days payment. How about we do 20 days, the government pays everything in 20 days. And he said, no, 15 days. And in fact, we instituted quick pay, and I have to credit you well. with being the um, initiator of the idea. So well, I think made a big impression. I, I think that we, we should always focus on so-called stakeholders and customers. You know, oftentimes we in government, you know, look at things from our perspective as opposed to the people that we're trying to serve. So it should be, you know, how do, how do we really make the people who use government value those services and feel good about the services that they receive? So let's talk about China. 
in, now that we've taken care of the United States. <laughs> we'll come back to the United States in a minute, but just to get the lay of the land on China, as I was preparing for this, I really saw that there were three camps, three theories about China. The first is that uh, the positive theory, the positive economic theory about China. China is good, it is growing, it is going to be a place where American companies and other companies can do business, large companies will build plants there, small business will sell through the Alibaba platform. Um, there is going to be much prosperity from a healthy and strong economic China. Then there's the pessimistic economic view of China, which says um, the country is going to have a very difficult time transitioning from a manufacturing economy um, to a consumer economy, that um, the low costs in China take American jobs, hollow out our middle class, and that it's difficult to deal with China on an even playing field, and they manipulate their currency. And then there's the foreign policy view of China, which seems to say, if I can sort of sum it up, China has really been an important force in the world for 3,000 years. America's been around for a couple hundred years and been important. So eventually, um, China and America are heading for at least a rivalry, if not a, some kind of conflict. Do you subscribe to any of the three theories of China, or do you have your own theory? Well, I think it's a little bit of all, of all three. I mean, all three are, are true. Uh, certainly, uh, incredible opportunities in China for American companies and Western companies. Uh, yes, China is going through a transition, uh, trying to move away from a low-cost, low-wage, uh, export-driven manufacturing sector to more consumer uh, uh, consumption, more innovation. But with that growing middle class and, and the, 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 the progress of middle class in China from just single digits a few years ago to more than 50% of, of all the cities with over a million millionaires, with more billionaires in China than there are in the United States today. But the growing middle class, that's an incredible market for American-made goods and services. I mean, the American brand is whole, so highly valued and in great demand, whether it's you know, medical devices to milk and food to uh, engineering services to clean up the environment. And certainly with the uh, internet platform, I mean, uh, s small American businesses can now market their products to China directly, whether it's through Amazon or Alibaba. Uh, and uh, some of the big U.S. companies are having difficulty in China. There is oftentimes an unfair, unlevel playing field uh, with respect to U.S. companies, uh, favoritism, you know, blatant favoritism for, U for Chinese companies, applications of U.S. companies to grow and expand are, you know, not acted on for years and years and years, whereas the Chinese competitors are getting theirs approved right away. Mm. I mean, obviously, they're trying to favor their national companies and hope that uh, they'll be sufficiently strong to go global and even beat American companies. So there, there's that favoritism. Uh, the Chinese economy is obviously undergoing a lot of stress and some of the reforms are kind of being um, pulled back. Uh, but uh, you know, at the same time, they know that they have to move forward on rule of law, protection of intellectual property, if nothing else, in the economic self-interest of the Chinese companies. A lot of those Chinese entrepreneurs are complaining about spending lots of money on R&D, developing a product and innovation, only to have it ripped off by some other Chinese company. And so the Chinese leaders and the Chinese businesses know that if the innovation is to occur in China, there has to be intellectual property protection. Otherwise, that R&D will occur in Taiwan or Singapore or Korea or other places. At the same time, China is a has a glorious history of thousands of years of civilization, inventions of the compass, the clock, the printing press, paper, you name it. And we're a relatively long, young country. China really feels the, the, the shame of colonization, westernization, the isolationist policies of some of their more recent uh, dynasties or emperors. And so they, they, they want to reassert themselves as the middle kingdom. Uh, yes, there will be differences with America, I don't think uh, it's in anyone's interest to have a conflict. I mean, Kissinger says, you know, if we, if we went to war with China 
and let's say the United States won, what would we do with China? You know, do we want China? How can we rule China? And the same thing, if we went to war with China and somehow China won, do they want America? You know, I mean, given our, our, uh, our, our society and our customs and, and, the, the, and all the issues that we have in America. So uh, the reality is that China and U.S. relations are much closer today than they were even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 40 years ago when, when Nixon first went to China. You know, China is America's number one export market for our agricultural industry. What we grow and what we process, China is our number one export destination. And they need our soybeans to make into oil, uh, cooking oil, or into feed for their, for their livestock. Uh, and so much of what we buy at Macy's and Costco and everything else is made in China. So our, our economies are intertwined. And there's a lot of partnership on scientific research, uh, fighting piracy off the coast of Africa, uh, climate change, clean energy, uh, or trying to get North Korea to stop developing a nuclear weapon. When you were appointed ambassador, it was another really actually historical moment. The first Chinese amba uh, American ambassador to China. And I actually remember uh, people saying to me, you know, he's just mobbed in this country and in China by people who were so proud that, um, so tell us what it was, like to be ambassador? Do you have um, policy uh, authority? One of the things that you did, I know when you were there, back to your metrics, is you started to measure the pollution. <laughs> Maybe you'll also tell that story. Well, actually, that uh, um, we're measuring the pollution, uh, what we call PM 2.5. It's particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns. It's the really nasty stuff that gets into the bloodstream that actually prevents the human lung from fully developing. And if the human lung is not fully developed by around age 18, it will not, you cannot make up for it when you come back to the United States or something like that. So it's of great concern to parents and American staff with young kids. And it was actually started just before I arrived, but um, the Chinese government did not want us to publish the results. They wanted us to, uh, and we were disseminating on our website so that anybody could come to our website, Americans, Chinese individuals, anybody could go to our website, embassy website, and find out the reading. And uh, we said, no, we're, we're going to broadcast it um, because we have an obligation to make sure that Americans in Beijing know of the air quality. There's actually a U.S. law that says that you cannot keep information that's vital and important to the health and safety of American personnel. You cannot keep that away from the other American personnel in the community. So for instance, if we knew that the water was contaminated and very, very unhealthy to drink, we could not just keep it to the embassy employees and not tell all the Americans in Beijing who are working for Boeing or GE or tourists or students. I mean, I mean that would be outrageous. We have a duty and obligation to inform the entire American community. The, inter the schools would use that information about air quality to decide whether or not to let the kids out for recess. And then some of the schools, if it was really bad reading, would cancel all varsity sports competition at the high school level. And uh, we then we had these influential bloggers who had tens of millions of followers who would then retweet the, this information on the Chinese version of Twitter, which is Weibo. And so we developed this public consciousness and the Chinese government asked us to stop and we said, sorry, no. In fact, we didn't stop. We also expanded the program and, and put these monitors on all of our consulates throughout China. And the Chinese government at first was collecting the information, having their own readings, but not telling the public. And then the people said, well, wait, you're collecting it, but you're not going to tell us. The, Chinese, uh, the American embassy is collecting it and telling us. So they kinda, we kind of shamed in some ways, ah. uh, forced or encouraged the Chinese government to start releasing so the information. So maybe that's part of the policy. And what was the most difficult um, task or, or policy or political moment when you were in China? Well, there were two situations that occurred. Uh, one was this um, police chief for uh, um, uh, Bo Xilai, who was the party secretary of Chongqing, uh, a son of a revolutionary, he's called a princeling, um, and uh, really vying to be president of China someday. And um, uh, he had a police chief that 
went to our consulate in a neighboring jurisdiction and in essence in the middle of the meeting blurted out he wanted to defect. So that was an international incident and Boshi Lai sent all of his armed police to surround our consulate in, Chung, in Chengdu. Um, and that's like sending the police from the state of Montana to surround a government office building in the state of Washington. First of all, you know, the police in Montana have no jurisdiction, no authority outside the state of Montana. So, but Bo Xilai sent his security people to surround our Chinese consulate in a, another jurisdiction. And this guy was afraid to leave the consulate for fear of his life. And um, we could not help him. First of all, if you ever want to defect, you have to be out of the country when you ask to defect. <laughs> you know, if you're a Russian general and you have all these special secrets about the Russian military, you have to get outside of Russia first and then run to the French embassy or the US embassy and say, let's say you're in France, and then you say, I want to defect. It's like, you know, the Russian ballet. You know, people, they're on a tour. They're in the United States. They're in France. That's when you defect. You know, you're a Cuban athlete. You know, you want to defect. You have to get out of the country first. Because if you're, let's say, the Russian general and you want to defect and you come to the US Embassy in Moscow, how are we going to get you out of Russia? If we drive you out of the embassy, the Russians will stop the car. If we somehow get you to the airport, they'll stop the plane from taking off, all right? It's not like we can fly you out of the embassy, uh, straight from the embassy to whatever country. So we couldn't let him defect. In the, in the end, we arranged to uh, give him communications so that he could communicate with Beijing and he arranged to, to uh, turn himself into uh, the authorities in Beijing who gave him safe passage to Beijing in which, after which he kind of spilled the beans on what was happening with Bo Xi Lai, claiming that his wife had murdered a British citizen and that Bo Xi Lai was trying to cover it up, et cetera, et cetera. So that was very tense and we were in this situation room that has very secure communication. We were there for almost 24 hours trying to figure out what to do. The other one, of course, was when uh, the blind dissident, uh, uh, Chen Guangchun, uh, came into the embassy and we were giving him medical treatment and safe harbor. And, um, and, but you know, this is a person who did not want to defect. He wanted uh, just to be free of the persecution and harassment faced in his local village in Shandong province. And he wanted to be able to live somewhere else in China with his family. And so we were trying to negotiate on his behalf, kind of, you know, his freedom, uh, a new place, a new life within China, because he wanted to help democratize China and be there when China became a better society. We, uh, we, and at one point, you know, that was very, very tense because also Hillary Clinton was coming in along with other cabinet members for a, a major dialogue with the Chinese government. We wanted this resolved before those, uh, those dialogues occurred, but, as much as we wanted to resolve it, we were going to be true to U.S. principles. And at one point, uh, we, we refused the, uh, the uh, we reached an impasse with the Chinese government and we were starting then to focus on enabling him to live permanently or at least for a long period of time in the Chinese, in our U.S. embassy. And so we were not about to kick him out uh, just because uh, we had this impending high level dialogue between U.S. and China. And it was a, a proud moment for us because we were upholding the values of America. We were not going to sacrifice this one guy just because we had a high level dialogue ar around the corner. And that was a great moment. So, tense moment, but a great yeah. moment. So, in a minute, um, I'm going to open it up for questions. And um, the guidelines for questions introduce yourself, keep it short, and make sure it is a question. Um, there's mics in the side and in the back, and while you're getting set, I'm going to ask you one other question, which is something we're all dying to know, and that I don't know. Um, we worked for President Obama, and there are a lot of things people always ask, what's he like? Um, but you know what his golf game is like, <laughs> because you've played golf with him. So everyone wants to know, including the press, How's his golf game? He is a very good golfer and quite a, a natural athlete. 
And um, you're, you're quite a good golfer. No, I'm an terrible at it. I started way too late. I started way too late in golf. And uh, I remember the first time we played, he hadn't played golf in quite some time. So I think he shot in like the, the mid 80s. And then about three weeks later, we played again and he shot in in the high 70s, so he's, he's a natural athlete. But the nice thing about it is that I was so nervous because I'm hitting my balls all over the place and trying to find my balls and running to the ball and I didn't want to hold up the present. He said, Gary, hey, we're here to have fun. Just relax. So he really made, put you at ease and so that's really great about him. You know, he's, he's a very low key guy and, and very natural and, and very good. What about your first, I'm going to turn the questions on you, so <laughs> what, what, what great memories do you have of, of being with President Obama? You know, I have to say, I th it was a pure pleasure to work with the President, um, and my best memories are going to visit small businesses during the uh, recession, and he would, not only did he um, listen to what they had to say, he understood exactly what their business problem was, and then he'd always turn around and say, okay, you gotta solve his business yeah. problem. You gotta solve her business problem. Yeah. He was really there for the American people, um, particularly with a deep understanding that I don't think he gets credit for, for this, the business owner and for what was going on in, in the economy for them. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't think that he and all the members of his administration get enough credit for making government a lot more efficient, being more responsive, paying the bills, getting that money out to small yeah. businesses. Because, I mean, you know, if it takes you 90 days to get he your money. He actually thinks I mean, that, like you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, he likes that, things to, you know. Yeah, that really move. hurts. And he was so supportive of agencies trying to reform themselves. And I think he was, you know, was really pushing us to, to deliver services that could respond to the needs of the American people. He thinks of the American people as the customer. Yeah of government yeah. and uh, really cares yeah. about customer service. You know, getting back to that whole thing about metrics, I've always, you know, it started when I was county executive and I knew nothing about it but uh, performance management and then uh, bringing in loaned executives to really help yeah. oversee it. Not that these loaned executives from the Boeing company or Microsoft knew anything about counting ballots faster. I mean, I, I had this pet peeve being a political junkie. I wanted to know who won the election, whether the ballot measure for the schools passed or lost before the 11 o'clock newscast went off the air. We oftentimes had to wait till the next day to find out whether it had won. That was so frustrating to me. And so you fixed it. So we fixed that, you know, and, but we brought people in to help challenge our government employees on asking questions. Why do you do it this way? Can you do it better? Not that they had any answers, but really to get our employees to think out of the box. And the big thing about metrics is I always believe in charts. And sometimes I would spend three weeks working with our agencies on the right shape of the chart and what would be on the chart so it would be readily understandable. But once we locked in on that chart, that's the only chart we're going to use, the format that we're going to use for the next three or four years. So and that I'm, makes the difference. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you for coming to speak with us today, Ambassador Locke. My name is Sam Leichinger. I'm a sophomore at the college. My question is, uh, recently The Economist had a cover article titled Beware the Cult of Xi, referring to the consolidation of power by President Xi Jinping. I wanted to know if you agreed with the char uh, characterization of the president and whether and what you think his style of leadership will mean for China's global relations in the future. Well, I don't know that if, if he's really developing a cult relationship or image, but certainly he, the people of China very much like him, adore him, revere him, and he's a very different type of leader. Certainly he has amassed power faster uh, uh, than, uh, and in more concentrated form than previous leaders, uh, and he has assembled these task forces in which he's the, the key, whether it's on some of the reform measures, the economy, of anti-corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So he's uh, become certainly a lot more, you know, in the center of, of policy initiatives and changes and reforms. Now that has good or bad, I mean, uh, implications. If they w go well, then, then it'll elevate his status and, and um, image uh, among the Chinese people. If some of these things go bad, then he'll get blamed for it. He can't distance himself for it, from it. He's a much more relaxed leader than, than previous leaders. Um, when he meets with foreign dignitaries, he doesn't use, you know, it's not reading from a script. He c makes his points, but in a much more relaxed fashion. He's much more self-confident and, and at ease uh, with, with uh, uh, dignitaries, and I think even with the public. You know, he's, 
doing even the Bill Clinton and, and, and President Obama stuff, going out to, and even Vice President Biden. I remember our Vice President Biden's first trip to, uh, to China just after we arrived as ambassador. Vice President Biden went to a noodle shop. And some of the Chinese newspapers said, well, that's just an uh, imperialist American plot to destabilize the Chinese government because Vice President Biden is going to a noodle shop and eating with the people. And then I was criticized for you know, buying Starbucks myself and wearing a backpack or flying economy class. I mean, I was, the picture of me buying Starbucks coffee with my daughter with a backpack was in Seattle as we were getting ready to get on the airplane to go to China. Didn't even know that someone was taking a picture of us, all right? And, and, the, and some of the Chinese press said that was part of this calculated American effort to destabilize the Chinese government. Well, Xi Jinping now is going out to noodle shops and, and dumpling shops and doing the same thing. So, um, but he's a very different style leader and um, uh, I think he has a very strong historical sense of China and a pride of China and wants to restore and elevate China's image around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Auden Lawrence. I'm a senior at the college. Um, if there's one thing I've learned from Karen, it's the importance of public-private partnerships and the benefits that they can have for the government. Um, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier um, in the earlier portion, but I was curious to know what issues or sectors you think the government is most lacking in their partnerships with the private sector and where there's the most potential for growth and benefit of these public-private partnerships? Well, my view is that government can never do it all. Regardless of how much money you have, we, there's never enough money to satisfy everyone's wish list. And so whatever government does, it should try to do very, very well and perhaps abandon uh, other things because it's better to do a few things really well than to do everything in a mediocre fashion. And I think that uh, because of our limited funds, we should be trying to collaborate with the private sector. using. And I, I've never believed that you can operate government like a business. I mean, how do you run prisons uh, or mental health services? I mean, if people don't pay, are you gonna then kick them out and say, okay, you, you didn't pay, so we're gonna let you free, all right? because uh, you're, you're, we're not profitable. But you can certainly use business principles in how you run government. Uh, but I think in a lot of the services that we provide, uh, we can um, have more partnerships with the private sector, whether it's in the delivery of health care or even you know, uh, delivery of services for veterans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, if, if you can't get an appointment in at the VA hospital, what's wrong with having local providers provide those services in order to shorten up the time frame. Uh, and, and so I just think that we have to be a lot more innovative. When we were ambassador, uh, we wanted to do a video on um, investment, the investment climate in the United States for Chinese investment. And we wanted to, uh, I, I raised the money, uh, but I knew that if we uh, went through the State Department and asked for money, it'd take forever or Commerce Department wouldn't give it to us. And if we went through the government processes, we'd have to have this competition RFP proposal that would take a year, year and a half before we could uh, uh, do this. So we said, screw it. We'll, we'll, I'll raise the money, and then we'll give the money to a private company, and we will have full editorial control. So we ran it through a private sector. We got the video done in about a month and a half, and it was a seven, eight minute video that we've used all around China to promote investment opportunities in America. I think we have to be a little bit more creative using the private sector on a lot of things. So, yeah. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming. <clears throat> My name is Weiwei, and I'm an MPV1 student here at Kennedy School, and I come from China. I have two quick questions for you. The first one is about your choice to resign on 2014. You didn't finish your term. Is it because Seattle has better air, better <laughs> coffee, or because you got a lot of pressure after you deal with those two tense and sensitive issues? The second question is, I remember you once said, like, you are proud of your Chinese heritage, and you know a lot about Chinese people. And, like, uh, if I want to ask, what's your suggestions for the future president on South China Sea, and what will like what your suggestion would be, thank you. Uh, actually, for 
I'm a political, I was a political appointee as ambassador. I'm not a career diplomat. And the career diplomats have set terms in their postings as ambassador. Political appointees have no set term. And of course, all ambassadors, even if they're a career a foreign service officer, serve at the pleasure of the president. So if the president says, okay, you're a career diplomat and you're the ambassador to Chile, well, I want to change. And so you, you serve at the pleasure of the president. For political appointees, and about 20% maybe of all U.S. ambassadors to other countries are political appointees, we serve at the pleasure of the president. There is no set term. And in fact, oftentimes ambassadors in these political positions only serve for maybe two years. I was there for more than two years. The reason we left was because my daughter is a junior in high school. And we wanted her to have, we suddenly realized she's going to be a junior in high school and we wanted her to come back to America to have her junior year in America college, in America high school. Because when she becomes a senior, we wanted the teachers to have known her for at least a year so they could write a letter of recommendation for college. So if we actually stayed for another year, my son wanted to graduate from high school in China. And, but that would have meant staying beyond President Obama's term. Well, as soon as President Obama is out of office, whoever the next president is, Democrat or Republican, they're going to want a new ambassador. So we would have to move out of the ambassador's residence and we would have to live for six months on our own in Beijing. <laughs> uh, housing is very expensive. The international schools are very expensive. And, or we would have sent him back to the United States just six months before President Obama leaves office so that he could start his senior year. But then, you know, you start your senior year in September, college applications are due like in October, and you have to ask a teacher to write a letter of recommendation and the teacher's only known you for one month? How are they gonna do that? So we were not gonna stay in Beijing until President Obama left office. And then for our daughter, who is about to be a junior, we said, we got to send her back to the United States so she has a full year with the teachers in the high school who can write that letter of recommendation. So it's the kids. So it's the kids. It's the kids. And so we were not going to just send our daughter back by herself. The family's going to go back. Now, I actually stayed a few months longer after the kids started school in September, and I left back, basically announced in October that I was leaving. That was a, we actually knew in the spring, almost a year before I left, that we were leaving. We just didn't tell anybody but we were already looking at the schools for my daughter back in Seattle, Washington. And it was a great experience in China. I mean, our family loved it. The Chinese people were so warm and friendly. It was great that my kids could explore and discover the China of their ancestors. And uh, so that was a great experience. With respect to the South China Sea, very, very complicated, and I, I have no advice for the next president. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think that we need to avoid the conflict. We need to avoid conflict. It's in no one's uh, interest to have a conflict over the South China Sea, whether it's between Vietnam, the Philippines, the United States, China, Indonesia, and other countries. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ben Cohen. I'm a first year student in the business school. And as an American who is in China for four years, thank you for making sure that the index, the air quality index, was updated every day. I lived and died by that. Um, so similar to the last question. <laughs> yeah, I can't get the notifications to turn off. Um, <laughs> so similar, similar, I guess, to, to the last question. As China continues to step out into the world stage diplomatically, how do you see it using its military to project power beyond the South China Sea? And do you envision that it could become embroiled in foreign conflicts similar to how the United States is in the Middle East? Well, I, you know, I think many of you are better students of Chinese history and culture than I am. But I, you know, China has never really been one to intervene in the affairs of other countries. I mean, you look at uh, their involvement in the Middle East uh, and um, Southeast Asia, they've always tried to stay away. And um, uh, I think that's part of the Chinese history and custom. So, um, but of course, they're building up their military. They're asserting themselves in the, you know, the, with, with the Japanese islands, uh, as well as with the South China Sea. So this may or may not be a departure. Um, so we'll just have to watch that. But uh, it's, it's, China has never really been an interventionist uh, country. Um, and we, America, want China to step up 
uh, and help in international affairs. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people, a lot of people don't know, but China actually contributes more in terms of peacekeepers to the UN uh, peacekeeping forces than virtually any other country. Um, but uh, those are peacekeeping roles, um, and uh, uh, the United States and China have worked together on trying to fight piracy off the coast of Africa. So we want, we wa we welcome uh, the peaceful rise of China and a more prosperous China. But we also want China to be more involved in international affairs, uh, uh, taking on a greater role and responsibility. I mean, China benefits from American military presence in Afghanistan and other places. And, and under that protective cover, they're able to have their companies be actively engaged in trade there. And actually, China is a little bit worried as we pull out uh, who's going to provide the security. Uh, in those regions, which are very hostile and, and uh, uh, could be very problematic for all companies that remain. So uh, we want China to step up a little bit more. Hi, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Happy Ye. I am a senior at Harvard College. Uh, I was born and grew up in Guangdong, China, where your family is, is originally from. <laughs> and um, I'm uh, studying economics and government right now. So my question for you is that, um, you know, given that you're the first Chinese American um, serving as a governor of any state in the United States, I'm just wondering uh, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing is Asian Americans um, interested in working in politics? Well, I think that with a lot of ethnic minorities that are have different physical characteristics from Caucasians, that whether you're African American or Asian American, that will always be sometimes considered different and always standing out. And uh, maybe not by all parts of America considered part of America. Um, I mean, I'm proud of my Chinese ancestry, but I'm also thoroughly American, born and raised in America. I'm proud of what America stands for, its diversity, its rule of law, its innovation, its uh, democratic principles. Um, and um, I sometimes wonder when, when there are stories about you know, whether African Americans or Asian Americans that somehow were branded as not being, you know, American. And just because one Asian American commits a crime uh, doesn't mean that all Asian Americans should be suspect. You know, there are these espionage cases and things like that and um, involving Chinese Americans and immediately, well, then maybe we ought to be worried about all Chinese Americans possibly being spies for the Chinese government just because of the acts of individuals. And we, heck, we have, you know, we had people who were spying for Israel. And we don't go around saying that all Jewish people are somehow spies for Israel. So I, I sometimes worry that our physical characteristics, our different physical characteristics makes it easier for others to just lump us in as somehow not American. Hi, um, my name is Guan Chen. I am from China. Um, I've, I received my associate degree in Seattle Community College, and I'm currently uh, a junior at uh, Harvard Extension School studying economic and computer science. Um, so my question is, uh, as the first um, uh, state government uh, and a Chinese American, um, it's similar to the question uh, that were asked before, that how do you think of the situation that uh, Asian American uh, is lack of political power in the U.S. And what do you think that we, as American uh, Asian American, could do to change this situation? Thank you. Well, you know, Asian Americans also have a little bit of a burden because you know Asian American is a label that applies to so many different ethnic ethnicities and languages and cultures. I mean, it includes Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian. Mm -hmm. and and, and uh, Southeast Asian Indians. And so um, uh, different languages, different cultures, different perspectives. And so you know, the Asian American community is not in, any, not in any way monolithic. It's not like we have a common history, uh, uh, you know, unlike Hispanics or maybe African Americans who have the, the, the civil rights experience or even the, the dark periods of slavery that, that in many ways unite them. Um, so trying to find that common issue around which Asian Americans can focus on is very, very tough. Um, and you know, 
many people think that Asian Americans are a, a model minority, but they're not. We also have so many issues and, and problems within the Asian American community. Let me just say that uh, I, I was very proud to be the first Asian American governor on the mainland. I mean, Hawaii has had Japanese and Filipino governors because, you know, the majority of their population is Asian, so it's easy. State of Washington, we have only about 5% Asian American, and yet I, I won with over 60% of the vote. Throughout my political career, I've made it a point to try to be the most effective, respected government official I could be in whatever role I had, believing that just as successful, respected Asian American elected officials like Norm Mineta and others, and even in Seattle, a guy named Wing Luke, who was the first Asian American, Chinese American city council member of a large U.S. city, that when they were effective and respected, it made it easier for those of us who followed to run for office and win. And so I really believe that I could help the cause of Asian Americans to encourage Asian Americans to run for office and make it easier for them to win if I had a reputation of being an effective, respected governor. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I can help break and shatter the glass ceiling. Let me try Thank to you. get yeah. two more very yeah. quick questions in, one here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Is this, is this on? Yes, uh, thank you so much. My name is Evan. I'm a joint degree student at the Kennedy School and the Business School. Um, so we've talked a little bit about sort of potential future threats to the status quo of the U.S.-China relationship of the South China Sea or others. So from your experience um, sitting across from the table from the Chinese during a couple of the most high tension moments in that relationship in the last decade, did you feel that your counterpart sitting across the table had sort of similar assessments of what the risk to the relationship was or did, did they value the status quo of the relationship similarly to the way the Americans did or, or were, there, were there differences there? No, I think the Chinese government officials very much value the U.S.-China relationship and are working very, very hard to minimize those differences and to try to come up with solutions. We may not agree, uh, whether it's on trade issues, whether on some of these sensitive diplomatic issues. They knew that these things were so minor in terms of the broader U.S.-China relationship and the benefits of that strong U.S.-China relationship because China very much wants a strong U.S. economy, just as we in America want a strong Chinese economy because a strong Chinese economy means a growing middle class that will want to buy those made in America goods and services. A strong U.S. economy means people in America with money in their pockets and when they go to Macy's and other places, the reality is that they still, a lot of that stuff is still made in China, so it means jobs for the Chinese people. We're gonna have differences and I think a lot of those differences in the future will be over cybersecurity, intellectual property rights and the trade secrets and things like that. Um, and those are going to be very, very tough, very, very contentious issues. Yeah. Last Hi. quick question. Hello. Hi, so my name is Vaibhav and I'm a student at the Harvard Business School. Uh, thanks a lot for a terrific talk. You talked about that the U.S. wants a peaceful rise of China. But if you look at uh, a lot of things happening in the Pakistan theater or the North Korean theater, things are not really, I mean, there is a little bit of look the other way happening. Do you think the economic interdependence between US and China is reducing the possibility of a deterrent political and military power US can be in Asia? And uh, do you think that changing in the next couple of decades? Well, I think that we, both sides understand the importance of that economic relationship. And in the end, I mean, people want jobs. You know, uh, we need lots of jobs to sustain our community. Otherwise, there's domestic uh, upheaval, whether it's in China or the United States. I mean, a lot of these military issues, security issues are very, very, very complicated and involving many other actors. And I don't know that U.S. and China can somehow just come to an agreement and everything will be hunky-dory and all the other countries will fall in line. Um, you know, U.S. government is, is not monolithic and of one mind on how to approach many of these issues as well. You have differences in the Congress, you have differences within the administration among security forces, among the defense agencies, and things like that. Um, but I, clearly, I think people know the importance of, of the region and how volatile the region is. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to find solutions to terrorism and to instability, how to democratize and bring stability and peace and stability to the region. Uh, you know, a lot of people have different ideas on it within the United States, within China, 
and clearly between the United States and China. Thank you. Thank you. So, Gary, I understand that you are here through Thursday, mm -hmm. and many other people have questions. I know that you may be at some study groups yeah. and other things, so um, perhaps they can look for some announcements where you are going to be, uh, you're going to be at a breakfast for some students as well. So um, look on the, if you didn't have a chance to get your questions answered, um, Gary will be here for another couple days as a visitor to the IOP, and please Join me in thanking uh, Governor Gary Locke <laughs> for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It went by too quickly. It went by too quickly. Too Thank quickly. you. Well, I'll stick around for a few minutes.